Hey, what's happening everybody? Welcome to Tommy's Tone Vault and the Totally Rad Guitar in today's episode is this beautiful glitter rock white 1987 BC Rich Bitch 6 and it of course is the US custom shop made neck through. Yes! Now, this monster did not come to me in the condition you see before you. I got it from the original owner and it was for sale on Facebook Marketplace. I believe he had it up there for quite some time. It was originally black. He'd ordered it brand new back in 1988, which we're gonna circle back around to in just a sec. And it was done with the custom cross inlays, which were an option. And I believe they are the same cross inlays that I think the Iron Bird they did for Geezer Butler had, maybe? Although I could be mistaken. Uh, I think that Iomi had a guitar that had the cross inlays. I've seen a couple other ones. I believe the rhythm guitarist in Suicidal Tendencies had a Gunslinger or an ST3 that also had been custom ordered with these cross inlays. So pretty rad feature, but this was ordered all blacked out, black hardware, black knobs, black everything, and um, serious metal machine. I don't know if it was like, you know, this was right around the time the first Danzig record came out. So maybe he was really into John Christ or something. I can't blame him if he was. But it had definitely seen battle, <laughs> quite a lot of it. So this thing was in desperate need of a refinish. A lot of people would think I was crazy for doing it, but it, it was just absolutely covered in battle scars. And it had also had a headstock repair. According to the original, the original owner who I got it from, he said that the first year he had it, 1988, it had fallen, I don't know, while he was playing or just at rehearsal, whatever, headstock snapped clean off. He had a local luthier repair it and he never ever had trouble with it ever since. It survived shipping from Virginia all the way to me here in New York City. There were no issues. It's perfectly stable. There's absolutely zero indication that it's ever going to be a problem. So I think that he just got lucky and it was one of those headstock repairs that once it was re-glued professionally, never going to be an issue ever again but it was right for it was ripe for a refinish um i have a 1981 u.s mockingbird that's also glitter rock white and i have a 1986 u.s warlock also glitter rock white so the reason why i decided to refinish this one with glitter rock white it was like okay that'd be such a sweet like you know trinity of mockingbird warlock and bitch all in glitter rock white and it's pretty cool having them all next to each other i have to say so Back to the year. Now, I'm calling this an 87. The original owner swears to me that it's an 88. I even went back to him and I said, are you absolutely positive that you got this thing in 1988? Because even though he's the one that bought it new, when that many decades pass, our memories can play tricks on us. I've got actually a guitar that I'll be featuring in one of these videos at some point soon that I'm the original owner of, which is a rarity for Tommy's Tone Vault videos. And I could not tell you with 100% certainty whether I got it in 98 or 99. So that's kind of what happens with our memories with these things. We know roughly the time, but we can't be 100% certain unless we have like a sales slip or if we know that we got it before this gig, but after that gig and we could date it to a place in time. He swears 1988. The problem with that is the serial number indicates 1987. And I've got my notes open over here, so don't mind me periodically looking off the uh, off camera because there's so much stuff going on in these refinishes that I sometimes need to remind myself what I've done. So I hit up Brock Wood and Brock Wood is one of the BC Rich experts that you find on the Facebook forums. Really nice guy, really helpful guy. And he keeps a database of all the golden era BC Rich guitars. So starting in the early to mid 70s going all the way up to the very, very last gasps of the US Custom Shop, which I believe runs all the way up to 1989. According to his database, and this serial number, this has to be a 1987. He couldn't tell me the exact month or date like he sometimes can with some of the earlier instruments, but he swears this has to be 1987. So, I don't know what we're dealing with here. I don't know if the original owner was just mistaken, if the, all the decades just plays tricks on his memory, or could this be a situation where they had the body and neck blank already done up, sitting around, and then this got pulled off the shelf. It had a serial number for 87. It was finished up in 88 and sold. Who the heck knows? The, anyone who's really up on Golden Era BC Riches knows that it's absolutely the Wild West with these things. And even attempts at keeping an accurate database are tricky. Because Brock Wood has his database, 
and there's at least one or two other guys who also have their own database. And at one point they were all working on this database together. And then I guess some of them had a falling out and now they don't openly share their database with each other as it gets updated. <laughs> so BC Rich is a bit of a soap opera, unfortunately, but it's still, it doesn't make the instruments any less totally badass. So I'm gonna go ahead and assume that this is an 87 because I'm gonna go by the serial number because that's really the most concrete bit of information I have. So once it got into my hands, this thing actually perfectly played. Uh, the sustain was fantastic. All the original parts were still present. It had a pair of DiMarzio Super 2s. The original owner thought it was a Super 2 and a Super Distortion. It was actually a Super 2 and a Super 2, which is weird, but not completely unheard of. In fact, my 86 Warlock had the same exact configuration, and I got that from the original owner too. I don't know why they sometimes put a pair of Super 2s, because I thought that the, the standard configuration when you got a DiMarzio equipped BC Ridge back in the day was a Super D in the bridge. It's not what this had. This also has, what you'll notice, is an Ibanez original edge tremolo on it. Now, some of you might be saying, what the hell is an Ibanez edge trem doing on a US custom shop BC Rich? Funny story. So, I don't know if you ever looked online and found like the, um, they have the, all the brochures from the 80s for the BC Rich, the catalogs, and you can also find the price sheets for the US models, for the NJ series and it lists all the options for the custom shop. And of course, honestly, this guy was the limit, so it, you can actually go way beyond what's even was listed on the, on the official price sheet as far as options go. One of the options, of course, was a Floyd Rose option because we're dealing with the 80s. Apparently, it turns out that in 1987, if you selected the Floyd Rose option, they gave you an Ibanez edge. So <laughs> that's what this came with. Now, the one you're looking at on here is actually brand new. I ordered it brand new from Ibanez. So the original was all worn out. And the reason the original was all worn out is because the trem posts were actually not drilled in exactly the right spot. This top one was actually drilled about two millimeters over too far to the top. And it's even tight now, as you can see but it was actually wearing away the inside of the original trim. And it apparently never affected playability, but over decades of, this, of the original owner using this guitar and abusing the trim, the trim like you're supposed to, it had actually worn away like a semicircle there on that side of the trim. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm not gonna leave that alone. We're refinishing the guitar anyway. That's gotta go. So off to the refinisher. So for this project, I hit up my dude, Vince Michael, Vince Michael Custom Guitars in New Jersey. And he absolutely, just as an aside, he loves working on neck through instruments. It's probably like his forte and it's his favorite thing to do. So if you've got a neck through instrument or even a set neck instrument, hit up Vince Michael, you're gonna make this dude's day. He's a wizard with refinishing work. He's a great guy to work with and he loves working on neck through and set neck. Eh, bolt on not so much he'll do it if, if you kind of twist his arm but set neck and neck through that's your guy so i hit up Vinny, and i was like all right we got to strip this thing down to bare wood we're complete rebuild and one of the things i needed him to do was actually drill that out dowel it and actually relocate that bridge post in further so it could be in the correct spot another thing that was wonky about this and these are problems that it came out of the factory with is the nut okay so this is a floyd nut i believe it's an r2 r2 or r3 I'm blanking on that but so in fact yeah uh yeah it appears to take yeah it's a floyd it's an r2 so if you look here you can see how it steps up a little bit with the wood that's not the way it came to me what they had actually done is they had machined it clear on down, actually almost below where the fretboard line even is. And to make up the difference so that this was sitting at the right height, they had a huge piece of flat black plastic stuck in there, along with like three or four thin steel shims. And then they had the nut. And it actually came out of BC Rich that way. And again, the guitar was perfectly playable and totally stable. 
but it's just it's shocking the amount of money that they probably charged this guy for and there was some actually some kind of wonky work you know this this was not okay this was definitely not okay this is not going to be too big of a surprise to the bc rich experts out there but when neil moser left in about end of 1985 and i believe he left among many other reasons because he didn't like the direction the company was going in where they were going to start working on they were going to start introducing super strats the st3s the gunslingers Mm, you have to agree to disagree there. The Gunslinger is an incredible guitar. Um, I guess there were management decisions he didn't like, but when he left in 85, a lot of people feel that that's the true end of the golden era. I go up to 89 because that's as late as you can actually order a genuine US made custom shop instrument. But a lot of people do stop at 85 when Neil left because they feel that there was an actual noticeable dip in quality starting in 86. And I gotta say, if I'm being honest, if I'm being fair, stuff like that, Stuff like that trend post kind of reinforces that. But, you know, everyone's entitled to their own opinions there. A couple of other peculiar things about this thing. It is actually a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale. Now, I had been led to believe for a while that all of the US neck through custom shop instruments were 24 and 5 8 scale. I believe my 81 Mockingbird is. I'm pretty sure my 86 Warlock is. In fact, my 82 Mockingbird, which is actually a pre-NJ, so it's, a, it's, a, it's Japanese, but it doesn't actually say NJ on there. I think that might even be 24 and 5 eighths. But this is 24 and 3 quarter, and I was a little bit thrown by that, and I was asking some of the, uh, the experts on Facebook, and apparently it was almost up to the discretion of whoever was carving the neck in any given moment, if they were going to do 24 and 5 eighths or 24 and 3 quarters, which is screwy as hell. But again, that gets back to what I was saying about how the BC Red shop was basically the Wild West and you can get anything that you wanted. And, uh, and apparently also some custom features that you uh, weren't expecting. So, but anyway, so Vinny did a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful job on this thing. Uh, I had him do a couple of things to it. I had him actually angle the back here because my intention was I was going to install what are called bitch feet. And anyone who's got one of the earlier Bitch 6s or Bitch 10s, I believe the Bitch 6s too, but definitely the earlier Bitch 10s, uh, especially from the Moser era, they are familiar with how there's an angle cut here and there's the little black rubber feet that sit there because what that allows you to do is if you wanna be a psycho, you can just take this to rehearsal and lean this right up against your amp like that because it's perfectly flat on the bottom. I don't do that because these guitars are insanely expensive <laughs> and I use guitar stands or guitar cases, but it's a, you know, it's a pretty neat thing to do. Um, I've just never gotten around to actually installing them. I got them from Neil Moser and along with the electronics that I mostly didn't use, but we'll get to that in a second as well. Um, but I just, I can't bring myself to drill into it. So I've just left it as is, but at some point maybe I'll install the feet. So moving on to the electronics. Now, the bitches are especially, along with the Mockingbirds and some of the custom ordered uh, Warlock electronics are notoriously complex. The bitch, the most complex because it has two onboard booster circuits, the very tone, it's just crazy. And you can do coil splitting, everything like that. There is a degree to which I am more practical than I let on. And I play 99% of the time on the bridge pickup with the volume on max, tone on max, and I never, ever, ever, ever touch them, ever, unless I just need to bring my volume down between songs for whatever reason. I don't mess with any of the crazy controls. I barely even use the neck pickup, honestly. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever used the neck pickup live. So when it came time to doing this one, I decided let's go in a little bit of a different direction here. Now I had, had Neil send me um, the parts for a full bitch electronic set, but I didn't have him wire it up because I wasn't sure I was gonna pick and choose what I actually use. But what I really, really wanted to do is I really wanted to put a Sustainiac in this thing. Because if you're gonna have a full floating locking trim, a Sustainiac turns this into a serious party. But what a nightmare putting that thing in was. So when I first got this thing back from Vinny and I put it all together, I tried putting the Sustainiac in at the time and I failed. And then I tried getting my dude, Evan Gluck, who is a local setup guy in Luthier. Um, good dude, uh, does a lot of work for me. I had him try putting, putting, putting the Sustaniac in, 
and it totally beat him too. So that's two people down. And I just went and I took the Sustaniac out and I think I stuck like just some kind of PAF whatever in the neck. And I was rocking this thing for like seven or eight months, did a couple shows. Sustaniac just sitting in the box. And I finally was like, what am I gonna do with that damn thing? It's just been sitting around just gathering dust. So I actually hit up Maniac Music, Alan Hoover, I believe his name is, the guy I bought it from a couple years ago. I was like, dude, what am I supposed to do with this thing? I talked about, I can't figure it out. He very, very kindly offered to allow me to send it back to him, and he was going to test it in shop. Turns out there was actually something wrong with one of the connectors. One of the wires had come loose in just such a way that you couldn't actually tell, but it was apparently the wire that drove the inductor, I believe is what he said. So no matter how much we tried fiddling about with different wiring different configurations, this thing was never going to work. So he was really awesome. He gave me a new connector, sent it back, and within one day of having this thing back, I was like, okay, this thing's going in the bitch. I have to see. And it worked perfect. And it's awesome. And it is so much damn fun. I had left a lot of the Moser electronics out of here originally in anticipation of putting the Sustaniac in. So there was plenty of room for me to put the control board. I put the toggles are on a separate PC that he sells that had just enough room in the center for me to install this dummy toggle so that it looked like stock controls, but only the two outer ones turn the Sustaniac on or off or select the modes. So you have harmonic, which I believe gives you that feedback kind of squeal. You have the root note mode, which just allows that note you're holding to sustain forever. And then in the center, you have mix mode, which I never ever use. But it fit perfectly. I didn't have to drill any different holes. I didn't have to expand them or anything. It fits perfectly in the factory holes for the Moser Electronics. So if I were to cover this up, you would never know there was a sustaining system in here. And it works like a dream. And then you could just hold the note out forever and like, Whoa! And it's just it's just too much goddamn fun i didn't use the knobs that were originally on this thing because they were just this black kind of like military kind of looking knob and these are the style of knobs that were used on the earlier bitches and i just love the look of that offset against the uh the glitter rock white so i found a seller on through one of the facebook groups that had uh, some of these in stock and i had to go this way kept the fairy tone knob because it's you know part of the stock look I believe, yeah, I, I went ahead and I, I replaced the tuning pegs with these. Let me see which ones these are. These are the, I apologize. This is what happens when you have 15 guitars. These are the Grover Super Automatic Machine Heads with Imperial Heads 109C that I got from Moser. And uh, you know what? Actually, while we're up here, I'm not even going to try hiding this. Go ahead and zoom in on that right there. You see what this is? See that? All right. And then I want you to come down here and I want you to look right there. I don't know if that's gonna turn up on camera or not. So, <laughs> when I picked this guitar up from Vinny, he's like, now you gotta be careful, you know, you gotta like make sure that paint fully hardens. Don't go crazy like I know you like to do. I'm trying to do my best Vinny, my best Vinny voice. He's like, don't go crazy tightening everything down too much. You're gonna mess the paint up. So I got it home and I waited about a day and I started assembling it. Of course, me being the way who I am as a person, you know, the way I am as a person, I over tighten things. I over tighten the, <laughs> the toggle switches. Um, and then I put this on a, I put this on a hanging stand 
and it turns out that the paint had not fully hardened yet, believe it or not. <laughs> so I kind of caused the paint to bubble up there in just a way that it's like, ah. But even worse was up here on the headstock where putting it on the hanging stand too soon, like a dipshit, it actually caused the paint to pull up a little bit and wrinkle. And at this point, there's no fixing it. I mean, you could try wet sanding that down and buffing it out, but like, I let that just stand as a, as a, a monument to my own impatience and stupidity. You know what I mean? It's just a reminder that uh, <laughs> sometimes I can be a little bit hasty. Um, but yeah, I absolutely, absolutely love the way this thing has come out now. It plays fantastic. Um, I can't say good, enough good things about it. I, I love the cross inlays. It's just so cool. It's a good thing that I wanted to go with Glitter Rock White because like these cross inlays, I don't know how many different colors these cross inlays work as far as aesthetically for me. Like they totally work on a black guitar and they absolutely totally work on a Glitter Rock White guitar with like black hardware and chrome accents. They absolutely would not work on a hot pink guitar. <laughs> Again, everyone's always entitled to their own opinions when it comes to aesthetics, but I just don't think they would work on anything but black or white. And it spent three decades as a black guitar. And now it's this gorgeous angelic glitter rock white with these cross inlays. But it can also be evil. <laughs> um, coming around the back here, I retained the metal right here. Uh, control cavity covers. I wonder if this is metal too. That might be actually that metal. Yeah, metal. These are all the original plates. Notice that I am using this DiMarzio clip lock, clip lock strap, and I have relocated. I did this prior to the refinish because I learned from other instruments. I moved this out as far as I could while it's still being structurally okay, and I moved this in to the inside of the horn. And this is a trick I learned from my Flying V, a way to get the, the instruments to actually balance. And as much as I love these vintage BC Rich instruments, and I really truly do, um, something that people don't seem to like to talk about is these things are neck dive monsters. Every single one I've got, except for my Gunslinger, has been a neck dive monster. My 86 Warlock, my 81 Mockingbird, my 82 Mockingbird, they all do this. And I don't know if a lot of the guys that collect these don't play in bands or don't take the guitars out of their cases or don't ever play standing up, but I play standing up in bands with other human beings on stages. And if you don't do certain things to make these things balance a little bit better, they are going to be neck dive machines. So if you move this strap button in the back inward on the horn and if you move this one as far out on that top horn as you can and you do this get one of these leather with a rough back clip lock straps so it keeps this hugged in tight especially here because one of the cool things about this is you can rock this up on your knee and just put on a little clinic right up with your foot up on the you know floor wedge just you know, throw down, represent. And then you're not gonna have a strap button poking you in the top of your leg. This will keep the guitar balanced. Uh, in fact, I can even demonstrate just how good of a job this does. Look at that. Now, I'm, I'm sure some of the people out there either currently own a BC Rich Bitch or have owned one in the past and have experienced the insane neck dive look at how nice I've got this thing balanced on me. I will not accept neck dive. I don't care how vintage the instrument is. I don't care how valuable it is. Once it comes into my possession, I am moving strap buttons to where they need to be so I can actually play the damn thing on stage like it's meant to be played. So, but this thing, oh God, this thing is just so rad. I just, I really, really love it. Um, bridge pickup, what did I go with in this thing? I have a tendency to just try as many different boutique pickup manufacturers as possible. Like, oh, you know, what is, uh, what's Lawler got going on? What's uh, Zangbucker got going on? You know, I've always been curious about this one and that one. So for this one, I tried a Sheptone. And this one is the Sheptone Wanker, which is appropriately named. You know, it's, I guess it's his, uh, his ideal pickup for 80s wanking. And, um, you know, you don't have to ask me twice. 
but normally the wanker comes with an A5. Um, I've ordered mine F-spaced, of course, and the wanker is a, a reasonably hot output pickup, but I'm not a fan of A5 magnets. Um, I can fuck with an A5 magnet more than I can with a ceramic. I really am not a fan of ceramics at all, and it's one of the things that keeps me kind of away from the whole DiMarzio thing, because DiMarzio, they just, they can't seem to quit ceramics, man. They're obsessed with them. But this normally comes with an A5, and uh, I had a really bad experience with a Aldrich pickup by Soar, which is an A5. And I couldn't rip that thing back out of the guitar. It wasn't fast enough. Any other A5 I've tried, you, uh, it, just, it just hasn't really done it for me. I really seem to like A2 a lot. So what I did is I went ahead and I just swapped in an A2 into this Sheptone Wanker. So this is, I believe, the only Wanker out there with an A2 magnet in the bridge, and it's pretty kick-ass. And it works great with the Sustainiac. I mean, this thing is just, you know, it's a freaking metal machine. I love it. Just liquid sustain for days. And just, you know, is the right face. You have to, you know, just do, just, you know, just, just you know, give a little, little, little hammer on. Just, you can't hear it, you know. If it were plugged in, you, you'd be able to hear it. You know, you can just go like that. Just, just walk away. It'll just, it'll sustain for days. And go have a bite. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, so this is my amazing, amazing 87 BC Rich Bitch 6. Oh, you know, before we end this video, the name. I am sorry. I did not name this damn thing. I, <laughs> my poor, poor wife is sitting there taping this video for me as I keep referring to this guitar as a bitch over and over and over again. I did not name this. I admit it's a really stupid goddamn name for a guitar. Apparently, from what I've heard, Neil Moser came up with the name when he was at some kind of fair or something in the late 70s. He was working on the design for this. Either, either, either he had just conceived it or he was in the, in the process of working on it or something somewhere along the design stage. And they were trying to think of what the name was gonna be. And he saw some, like a couple teenage girls walking in this fair or this market. And one of them had a shirt on that said, rich bitch. And he, a light bulb went off in his head, and he's like, Rich Bitch? Oh, Rich Bitch, BC Rich Bitch. So he just called it the BC Rich Bitch and dropped the T out of bitch, and it's B-I-C-H, so Rich Bitch, spelled the same way. And yeah, it's like, ha, 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 it's cute, whatever. And it definitely worked with the direction that that company went with their marketing in the, in the 80s, where they would just have posters of, a, you know, just a woman from the belly button down, and the guitar neck is just basically pointing right at her crotch, and like, yeah, I get it, okay. <laughs> but it's it's a bit of an unfortunate name, but it is what it is. I didn't come up with it, but if I'm gonna refer to the guitar by what it is, yes, it's a BC Rich Bitch. And I happen to really, really, really love this one. It's it's everything I was looking for when I wanted one of these, and uh, took a little bit of work getting there, but I, I friggin' love it. So that'll be all for the day. Uh, maybe I'll even put a little clip at the end of me fiddling about. Actually, if I do that, it should probably be a little clip of me fiddling about with the Sustaniac, because, you know, that's what we're here for. <laughs> Let's not kid ourselves. And in the meantime, I hope you guys have an awesome holiday, however you want to celebrate it. And stay tuned for episode four of Tommy's Tone Fault. What's it going to be? I don't know. We'll see. Later, guys.